Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Alper. If you don't know me, I'm the education content manager for this year's Code Day Labs. I'm happy to welcome Anjana, who will be our speaker for our very last talk of Code Day Labs 2021. And I see that most of you guys are pretty hyped for it, and you, most of you guys are feeling well, but uh, I'm sorry to the people who aren't feeling too well. I hope you feel better. Uh, Anjana will be talking to you guys about data visualization for developers, and she is a um, software engineer at Observable. Anjana, if you'd like to give a little more background about yourself and get started, that would be great. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you all can hear me. It's a bit weird that I can't uh, hear or see you, um, so I'm just going to assume the best. Um, hello. Very happy to be here with you all. I am Anjana Vakil. I am a software engineer and developer advocate at a company called Observable. Um, we make JavaScript-powered, interactive, reactive, data visualization notebooks that run in the browser, which we're going to be looking at and playing with later today. Um, but I essentially am not here to talk to you too much about observable, but rather to talk to you about data visualization, which is something that um, I don't know uh, how much y'all have, have played with before or have run into. But I think this year, especially the last uh, the last year and a half or so with um, the COVID pandemic, we've all been looking at a lot of charts. A lot of visualizations, I think it's uh, it's become clearer than ever that data visualization is important and doing it right is important. And what I'm hoping we can talk about today is how it can be helpful to us as software developers in our lives uh, for doing our jobs well. And so, yeah, um, I am really excited to be dialing in with y'all. I'm dialing in from San Francisco today where I'm based and um, yeah, very excited to be here. So thanks so much for having me. Um, what we're going to be doing today, and, uh, and stop me, of course, at any point if there are questions or if there's any AV concerns or things are not, um, you're not able to find any of the resources that we're talking about, but what we're going to be doing today is a, a kind of a little bit of a mix. We're going to have some slides, but we're going to spend a lot of time doing some hands-on activities, um, but all of the materials live in live, editable, observable notebooks. So you can find these slides that I'm presenting to you here at observablehq.com slash at Anjana slash code day minus labs minus data viz minus workshop. Um, so that is where uh, we'll, be, we'll be getting those materials from. And um, in a few slides, we'll also have links to the, the hands-on exercise workbook that we're going to be working in today which is um, at the same, the same URL essentially, but with the word exercises on the end of it. Um, so I will, we'll, we'll get back to that in a moment. But for now, unless Alper um, had any other uh, logistical or administrative um, points. I think we're good, Anjana. Okay, cool, then I we'll just we dive right in. And thanks for the, uh, the patience. I know we're a little behind schedule. Uh, it's, always, it's always fun with Zoom, huh? So in any case, we have, um, uh, I think, a bit over an hour uh, now to all together. So let's dig in and talk about data viz. So what is data visualization? Well, one way we could think about it as the process of translating data to graphical representations. That is accurate, perhaps, but also really boring and doesn't really tell us much about why we should care about data visualization. Another thing you might know about data viz is that it is something that employers are looking for. Um, there is a lot of data out there and uh, business analytics teams, um, it, engineering operations teams, all kinds of different uh, teams are looking for folks who are skilled at working with data and pulling it together into dashboards, into visuals, into things that leadership at the company can look at and say, ah, yes, you're doing a great job. And so this is a this is a really in demand skill, and it's a nice um, addition to your kind of software development portfolio to be able to show that you also have um, the skills to be able to visualize the impact, the, the data that you are pulling from the impact of the work that you're doing. So that is that is true. It is a, a fancy skill that you can put on your resume, and that is helpful in job hunts. Um, but that also doesn't really get at the heart of the matter of why we, especially as software developers, should care about it. And so, so the, I think the most helpful way that I've found to think about data visualization is that it is a way to quickly find meaning and patterns in data. And why we want to do that is so that we can then 
from that data, gain useful insights that actually help us make the decisions that we need to make in our jobs. So this to me is the most helpful kind of way to think about data visualization that I've found. It's a way of visually instantly getting the insights, getting the answers that you need in order to go forward and, and make the best decisions that you can. Um, and so taking the idea that, that data driven decisions are going to be better decisions than ones that are just based on our kind of gut, you know, hunches and, and, and gut instincts, um, we can actually look at the data and actually find out what should we do. So that is what we're talking about today um, is a way of doing this. And, and this is because, you know, when we have some data, like here's some data about um, uh, what size and devices of screens uh, users are visiting a particular website with. So we're going to be looking at some of this data later. So when you're looking at data like this, like does this does this say a lot to you? Hmm, it says, OK, we've got several different types of devices. We've got several different resolutions. Certain numbers of users visit the site with certain numbers of sessions in these devices and resolutions. But I can't immediately draw any conclusions from just looking at these numbers, at least I can't, I don't know, maybe some of y'all are like uh, Neo in the Matrix, like I don't even see the code, it's just a girl in a red dress or whatever, but uh, that's not me. So what I need is something a little bit more visual. Um, how about now, does this, does this give you more information? If we have, uh, let's say, a scatter plot of that same visual, of that same data that's now visualized so that I can say, oh, Here's, a, here's all the mobile devices. They look like this. And here's what all of the devices together look like. Well, what can we tell from the data now? So right now I'm able to get some more just like quick impressions. Like for example, just glancing at this, it looks like I have a lot more desktop users than I do mobile and tablet users. And on desktop, it looks like, okay, what's this line right here? There's this very clear like line emerging. And that seems to be like a particular aspect ratio probably. If I were to get around here, it's around that 1920 by 1080, that like that classic 16-9 aspect ratio. So we see a lot of folks in that aspect ratio, fewer folks in the taller screens, except on mobile. If we add mobile in there, we can see, oh, like most folks are using mobile in portrait mode rather than landscape. So this is the type of visualization that, um, that we're going to be working on today. In fact, we're going to build this exact visualization in our workshop. Um, so what we're looking at is the width of screens versus the height of screens and broken down by different devices with some interactive controls here. So that is what we're going to be working towards today, um, because hopefully you all agree that it's easier to kind of get an intuition about data when we're looking at it than when we are just reading it in a table or in a CSV or in a spreadsheet somewhere. So that's what we're going to be building today. I hope that sounds good to everybody. Um, and we're going to be breaking that down into a few concrete tasks. So uh, bear with us as we as we break this down. We're going to take baby steps to get there. Um, all right. So why are we doing all this again? As developers, like our, we're not necessarily our core task isn't necessarily data analytics or um, or data science. But I think it can be very useful for us to um, to to think about the impact that data visualization can have on us and our day, our day to day as data, as developers in the software world. So there are some really uh, useful things that DataVis can help us do uh, when we're thinking about developing features. If we're product engineers, if we're product developers or developing sites or um, developing any kind of digital software, really, we can look at how people are using the features that we build to understand what we should build next, which use cases we've been thinking about, which user stories we've been thinking about that are actually represented in the data and how we should prioritize those based on how many users we have that fit into that use case. We can understand the impact of our work. If I just built out a new feature in, in the web app, I can understand by looking at the data how well that feature is being adopted, how well people are responding to it. I can also understand what improvements we should make. Like, should we uh, look at our designs in a certain, in a different light based on what usage data we see? So these are all the type of questions that data and data visualization can help us answer as feature developers, as, as product developers. We can also think about the performance of the things that we're building, especially if we're thinking about um, doing things like site reliability engineering or, or developer operations and making sure that our software is working 
um, quickly and reliably. So we can look at our analytics of how well our site is doing, how well our uh, deployed websites are doing to see, okay, how fast are they responding? to people's requests. How reliably are they responding? Are they throwing a lot of errors? Is Have we introduced bugs? Um, where are there maybe bottlenecks or, or pain points that we should focus on improving? Like where could we get the biggest bang for our buck in trying to speed up our site, for example? Or if we made some change, like maybe we made an architectural change or we swapped out a service because we thought it would be faster, we can actually see in the data did those changes pay off? Did we get the expected jump in, in speed or in reliability that we were looking for? So these are some other ways that we can think about data visualization as helping us um, figure out what we need to do next and as developers. And finally, you know, as software developers, we work together, right? So um, especially if you're working on an open source project or if you're um, working for a company that relies on open source projects or, uh, or if we're just looking at like thinking about a big team working on a distributed uh, code base, right? We've got lots of engineers trying to work together. So looking at data about the actual code base and how people are contributing to it can help us understand things like, okay, how is this code base laid out? Um, who is working in which part of the code base. So if I have questions about that, who do I need to go to on this team or at this uh, open source project? Um, how smooth is that development workflow? Like every time that I I'll create a new pull request or create a new contribution to this, how long does it take to get that from, um, to get that actually accepted into the code base? Um, how, how productive are we? How, uh, how many, uh, bug requests or bug reports are we fixing? How many feature requests are we delivering on? Things like that. And if we if we are running something that's open to the public, like open source software, how engaged are the contributors to that? Are people commenting on our issues on GitHub? Are people um, you know voluntarily writing code for our project? How uh, is our contributor community behaving? And how healthy is it? And what can we do to help them? So these are some of the other questions that, that get raised, especially as we think about uh, large distributed or especially open source projects. So this is some of the reasons why um, as software developers, learning a bit about data visualization cannot just be like an extra nice skill that we put on our resumes, but something that actually helps us do our jobs of writing software better. So that is why we're talking about it today. So um, if there are any questions or thoughts, um, please feel free to share them. I uh, I am not seeing any so far, but I'm still getting used to this Zoom webinar format. So yeah, guys, feel free to ask in the Q&A um, how we usually do it. And also, if you want to unmute your mic and say anything, you can raise your hand um, and I can allow you to talk. But if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the Q&A and I can let Anjana know. Awesome, thank you so much. No worries and, at all. Uh, and yeah, and also please stop me if I am, uh, if, you, if, if you missed anything or um, we need to go back at all. It's just, it's a little tricky without being able to see all of it, even, even in the virtual world. Um, but okay, so, so now that we've covered a little bit like why this might be relevant for us as developers, Let's take a look at the how. So uh, there are a lot of ways that we can do data visualization with computers. Um, for example, if folks work with Python, there's a lot of good um, plotting libraries for Python. Folks might have run into things like Jupyter notebooks before. Um, there are also things that are that are uh, perhaps more um, familiar to folks in academic contexts or in the uh, or in the data science world. Things like R um, and other statistical. Uh, analysis environments like that that have their own ways of doing data visualization. But given that a lot of us are going to be working in kind of um, modern day software development contexts that often involve web technologies, what we're going to be talking about today is how we do this in JavaScript. So um, even if you are not super familiar with JavaScript, hopefully this will all still be very doable. But the big advantage there is that um, not only does JavaScript have a lot of great tools for this, but also we can do everything in the browser with JavaScript. So we don't need to install anything. We don't need to get set up with any new environment. So we're going to be doing everything we do today right in the browser. Um, you don't have to open up any, you know, any um, IDEs or anything like that. And um, we're going to be working through, as I mentioned before, a series of hands-on exercises. So 
if you've um, if you've got the slides open, you can click through there. Otherwise, you can go to this link here, um, observablehq.com slash at Anjana slash code day minus labs minus data viz minus workshop minus exercises. Okay, it's long when you say it out loud, um, but this is going to be kind of a hands on workbook that we're going to work through together to um, do some data visualization and build that interactive chart that we looked at a moment ago. Um, and so switching back to the slides for a moment, there's going to be essentially four steps that we go through today. Uh, well, you know, off by one errors being a, a huge part of software development, the, the zero step, because we're going to start from zero, counting in our computer science way, is to get some data. Um, and that one, we're going to just sort of, we're going to start with some data that um, I've already pulled for you, that data that we saw about how users, uh, what, what devices users are looking at a website with. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how that process works. And then we're going to walk through three more steps where we're going to wrangle or reshape the data so that it can tell us what we need it to tell us. And we're going to visualize it um, with a scatter plot. And then we're going to add interactivity as we saw those little check boxes before. So um, in, in the zeroth step here, step zero, um, we are going to um, be talking about how to get data. Uh, yes, and there's a question of, can we put the link in the chat? I would love to do that if I had access to the chat. Um, perhaps can you, uh, you can, can put it as a type answer. Yeah, you can put okay. it as a type Thank answer. Thank you. Okay, now cool. I think, now that there's a question, I can answer it. Okay, I think great. William already put it, but we can put it as a type answer for that too. Great. Okay, so thanks so much. Yes, uh, awesome. Awesome. So thank you, William. That is exactly the right link. And uh, that I will just leave up there in the open questions. So thank you. Great. Um, okay. So now just keeping our attention on the slides for a moment, um, we're going to be not really talking about like where to get data, but in, in the real life day to day of working with data visualization, you got to start with some data or else there's nothing to visualize. So where can we find useful data about uh, that's going to answer some of those questions that we have as developers about how we're working together, how we're collaborating on code bases, how we're building the features we're building and what decisions we want to make, how our performance is, etc. So there are a lot of sources that you can find this data. Um, for example, if you're doing development on GitHub, GitHub has a really nice API. Um, so again, in the, the links to these slides um, are, is, is gonna be um, right here on, the, on that first slide here. Let me grab that for you all again. Um, these slides have a bunch of useful links as well. So let me see if I can, I don't know if I can put my own, I'm gonna add a new answer on. <laughs> Um, can someone ask a question so that we can write it as a type answer? Here, I will, I will respond to William's uh, question and answer, if that's okay, with the slides there. So in answered, I don't know if y'all can see these, but um, in response to, to William's question, you should see the link there as well. Apologies, there's usually a chat box that I could use here, but I guess not in the webinar format. Um, Okay, so in any case, in those slides, you'll find lots more links uh, that you can look through on your own time. We have kind of a short time together here, so um, we'll just power through it. But essentially, GitHub's API can give you lots of useful information about, um, about repositories, about uh, code dependencies, about pull requests and issues, and all kinds of things that are relevant to our day-to-day -day processes as developers and how we're working. Um, you might find that your company or the people that you're working with track data in something like Google Sheets, so you could fetch it in from there, or you can always export data from spreadsheets as things like a comma-separated values or CSV file. We'll look at an example of that in a moment. Um, you could also be exporting data from sites like Google Analytics, where um, you're going to get information about how people are visiting your site. So if you've, if you've created a, a website or you're working on your company's website, you can find in, in analytics services like Google Analytics, it might be a different one, but they'll provide information about the traffic to your site, um, where it's coming from, what kind of devices people are on, etc. And then there might be um, data that you're collecting, right? Like your company might have its own way of instrumenting uh, analytics uh, of the site, of user behavior, et cetera. And so that might be stored in a database somewhere, or you might be able to um, pull that down as a, as a local file and work with that. 
And so um, in observable notebooks, which we're going to be working with today, there are lots of great connectors so that you can work with local files, you can work with databases. If you have some data that's in like a SQL, like a MySQL database or a Postgres database, you can pull that in from there. So we're not going to be focusing too much on this today, but suffice it to say that um, especially if your data is connected to the web somewhere, but also even if it's static and local, you can pull it in to, uh, in this case, we're talking about JavaScript in the browser through Observable, to be able to explore it and play with it and try to visualize it. So let's, um, we're, gonna, we're not going to do this as so much a hands-on exercise, but we're going to do a little hands-on walkthrough together of how we're doing this in the exercise workbook. So we're gonna um, switch back to the exercise workbook and we're gonna look at the beginning. So step zero to see how we're um, essentially, we've got a CSV that we've exported from Google Analytics. We've uploaded it as uh, what Observable calls a file attachment, but you can think of it as a, a local file that we've uploaded. And then we're reading that into JavaScript and looking at the data. So let's take a look at how that looks. Okay. Um, and we're going to um, be looking, so hopefully at this point, everybody has this exercise workshop data visualization for developers. Um, just a note on Observable, what we're looking at right now is called an Observable Notebook. It is just a web page, so it is running in your browser. Um, and you'll see later that all of the code that we're using is, um, is editable, so you can change things in here. For example, I could change the zero to a one. And if I press uh, shift enter when I've when I've made some changes or I press that little blue play button on the right, if I press shift enter, I'll see my results update. So we're going to be doing this later. Um, but for now, we can just take a moment to read through. So let's see what's happening here. So we're going to be embarking on this project. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we're looking at which size devices users are browsing our site with. Um, so for example, our users on a desktop or laptop computer, like I am on a laptop looking at you all, well, not looking at you, but uh, <laughs> hopefully you're, you're able to hear me. Um, and, or is somebody looking at the website from their cell phone or from a tablet, et cetera. And what size of resolution is the screen that they're looking at with? because that might impact um, us as developers, especially if we're working on user interface or the UI, it might help us understand, okay, which widths or heights are the most important for us to have really strong designs for. So what are the most common kind of widths and aspect ratios that our users uh, work with so that we can make sure to have good designs for those? Um, or perhaps which, um, which screen resolutions do we see people using across multiple devices. So which, um, what, what kind of experience should people have across mobile and desktop so that they feel like they're having a good unified experience? So these are just some examples of the type of questions we might be trying to answer as developers doing a data viz like this. So the first thing we need to do is get some data. And again, we've done this for you, but what you might do in real life is go to something like Google Analytics and pull down there, they have some like mobile um, statistics around your site visitors. And you might export that as a CSV, a comma separated values file, which is going to look like a uh, .csv file that's gonna be on your local computer. And here I've uploaded that, this .csv file to my notebook and in Observable, I'm able to read it in, in JavaScript like this. Now, um, this isn't going to really a, a talk about observable, so we don't need to worry too much about this, but this is one way that you can attach a local file. It might be a CSV uh, data file. It might be a .json data if you're working with um, maybe data about um, responses to your website or things like that. It might be different formats. It might be a text file. And so um, we have a way to kind of parse that out, and I'm doing a little type true so that we get um, things like numbers are understood as numbers and strings are understood as strings. So what we've got here now is um, a JavaScript array full of little objects where each object represents a row in our data and it has different properties. So we have device, resolution, users, sessions. And um, we just pulled that into a table right here. So it's a little bit easier to scan through than looking at the JavaScript itself. So we can see this is essentially the data we saw really briefly earlier, where we have um, for each combination of device type and resolution, we have the number of users that we saw with that 
resolution and device, and then the number of sessions, so the number of uh, individual times that perhaps the same user visited the site versus the number of unique people or uh, you know clients that visited the site. And so then what we're going to do next, and um, we just displayed this with a little table here, we're going to talk about inputs later when we talk about interactivity. What we're going to do next is just pull out one object from this array. So I'm just I'm in the device analytics array, I'm getting the first element at index zero. And it looks like this. It's just a little object that has a device property with a string desktop a resolution property with another string that shows the uh, width times height. And then a users and sessions properties that each have integer numbers that represent the number of folks that we encountered with that. Okay, so this is just a real quick example of how we might go from data that lives on some other platform like Google Analytics and how we might download it as a CSV, upload that into a notebook, parse it into JavaScript, and then be able to take a quick glance at it just to understand what columns we have in this data set or what, what features um, this data has. So let me pause there um, before we go back to the slides. Any questions so far? Okay, so then now that we've got some data, and again, in your, in your case, you might have slightly different data, but this will hopefully be a, a generally useful uh, approach. What we need to do next is wrangle it. When we talk about data wrangling, we're talking about essentially reshaping, reformatting, or reworking data from the format that we got it, the raw format that it was given to us, whether by our Google Analytics or our logging platform or our product manager just gave us a spreadsheet or whatever it is. It's going to be in one shape. It's going to have certain properties. And we might need to, to massage it a little bit in order to get it into the format that we need and have the content that we need to easily answer the questions that we're trying to ask. So in order to reshape that data, um, there are a lot of tools and libraries that, that um, can do really advanced things for wrangling data. But in our case today, we're just going to stick with some built-in JavaScript array methods that help us work with JavaScript arrays. Because as we saw before, we read in our uh, our device analytics data as essentially like a big long array with 2,000 items that um, we're going to now be able to manipulate just as a JavaScript array of, of objects here. So what we're going to do is work with a couple of real handy JavaScript methods, um, array methods, excuse me, filter and map. So I am not entirely sure how much folks have worked with JavaScript. Um, if you're completely new with JavaScript, hopefully we'll be covering everything you need to know to be able to work with these. If you've worked with filter and map before, this will be old hat. Um, but let's just real quick talk about what these do. So essentially, uh, when we call dot filter on an array, what we're going to do is select only the items that we want. And we're going to give it a function to tell it which items we want and which ones we don't. And then map is going to, instead of selecting items, it's going to take every single item and do something to it. And we're again going to give it a function that tells it what to do to each item. So uh, a fun example that I like to use for this is uh, the uh, filter map reduce sandwich. <laughs> we're not going to talk about the reduce part, but essentially um, imagine you have, you're trying to, to cook something, or you're trying to make a sandwich and you have a bunch of ingredients, right? Um, the first thing you want to do is make sure that you're not putting anything you don't like into this sandwich. So we can do that. If we have an array of uh, veggies, let's say, in this case, it's a veggie sandwich. So if we have an array of veggies plus bread, I don't know if bread counts as a veggie, but it does for this example. And we have some function called I like that tells me for a given veggie whether or not I like it. So if I call I like a cucumber, no, I do not like cucumber. I like peppers, yes, I do like peppers. I like tomatoes, yes. I like onions, no. So this is going to be a function that returns a Boolean, a true or false value for every veggie. And I'm going to pass that into a filter method that I call on the veggies array to say, okay, for each veggie, if I like it, include it in the filtered array. So dot filter returns a new array with only the items that pass this test, essentially, only the items that I do like. So that's gonna be a new array that we can call liked veggies. So this is what we're going to do with filter is whenever there's there's data in the data set that we don't want, we're going to filter it out with this filter method. 
Then um, another useful method is to take everything in my, in my new array, the liked veggies, the only ones that got through, and then do something to it. So in this case, I, maybe I have a function called chop that's going to cut or slice each of these uh, items. And um, when I pass in a function like this, and what we're looking at here are JavaScript arrow functions. If folks haven't um, encountered these before, these are just really lightweight ways to declare a function where we have the inputs on the left and then the return value on the right of the arrow. So when I pass this into the, um, to the map method that I'm calling on the liked veggies array, I'm gonna take everything that, that came out of that liked veggies filtered array, and I'm gonna do something to it. In this case, each veggie is going to get chopped, and I'm going, that's going to return a new array called chopped veggies, or I'll call that chopped veggies. So again, map, dot map, just like dot filter, returns a brand new array where each element has been transformed in whatever way that I've specified from the original element. So um, this is probably a very a much a review for folks who've been working in JavaScript for a while, but if you haven't encountered JavaScript, these are a couple of the methods that we're gonna be using today. Um, does anybody have any questions at the moment? We feel comfortable with these. So filter to remove any stuff we don't want and map to do something to each element in an array. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do now is in exercise one in the workbook, we're going to use some JavaScript um, to essentially wrangle our data to make a couple changes to it. So let's go back to the workbook. And I'm gonna, okay, we, we're good with our data now. So if I scroll down to exercise one, what we want to do is in, in our original data, we, we have a resolution uh, property that is essentially, it's just a string and it has the width and then the letter X and then the height. So 1920 X 1080, right? Which is how we're often used to talking about this as humans. But in order to visualize this, uh, to get the computer to understand this data, it would be useful to have separate values for the width and the height that are actually numbers that we can work with as numbers, as opposed to this combined string that we have here. So that's what we're going to try to do now. We're going to try to take our original data and add new width and height values for each element. So what we're going to do is um, create a, a new array called devices that we're going to get by applying this dot map method to our original data, which we call device analytics. And we're going to pass that a function. And this function is going to take in each item and then do something to it. And so this is a little bit longer hand way of writing um, a, an arrow function in JavaScript. What we have here is a little code block where we can do whatever we want, do things here. And then we want to return something from each um, from each for each item. So what your job is, is to now take a moment and replace this, the, the contents of this function, with your own code, which is going to add width and height values to each element in the data. In order to do that, you're going to have to start from this resolution string, this 1920x1080, um, and split that into two different numbers. So there are some hints here. If you want to click that button, you can get some hints of how to do this. There's also the final, the, 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 um, the answer uh, in the solution button if you want to cheat. <laughs> Just kidding. But if you get stuck or if you're coming back to this later, um, we can look at that. But why don't we take a couple of minutes right now and I'll try to do it ourselves and you can lean on those hints if you need to. Sound good? So let's just take about five minutes here and then we'll walk through it together. And of course, if you have questions, go for it. Oh, I didn't mention this. I'm sorry. Um, complete oversight. This workbook that you're working with, you can edit the code in here as much as you want. And it's uh, all running right in your browser. Browser, This is like your playground. However, if you want to save your work and come back to it later, 
You can do that by um, signing up for a free observable account. There should be a little sign up button in the top right. And that will allow you to fork or make a copy of this notebook, which then all of your changes will be saved in. You do not need to sign up for an observable account if you do not want to. It just means that the next time you refresh this page, whatever code you've entered here won't be saved. So if you do want to save it, um, you can create an observable account with your uh, with your GitHub or with your um, Google account or even Twitter as a, as a login provider. And then um, that will allow you to create a new copy of this and save it as your own. Sorry for not mentioning that sooner. Don't forget you have some hints here as well. If you guys are done with the activity, please feel free to let us know in the Q&A. Great, yeah, I think um, that's been about five minutes. So if folks are, are ready, let's just talk about the answer really quick. Sure. Um, if there are any questions, of course, feel free to ask in the Q&A. So, okay, so what we're trying to do here is before we had an array of items that just have this resolution. Here we want to add a couple of new things. So what we're going to do is we're gonna return, instead of returning the original item, we're gonna return, return a new JavaScript object. And in JavaScript, we can declare an object like this, um, where we can have some kind of property and then a value, right? So um, what we want here is we want certain things to be the same. So we want the device, for example, to be the same as the original item device and uh, same for the resolution. We wanna keep that even though we're gonna um, still be adding new things. Um, and uh, likewise for the users and the sessions. Um, now there is a, there are shorter hand ways of writing this in JavaScript. So if you know some shortcuts for writing this, cool, awesome. Um, but if not, don't worry about it. And uh, sessions as well. Uh, oops, that's why it's not working. I typed the wrong character. Okay, so we're gonna, this is essentially just copying over the same info that we had from the original. Okay, but that's not all we want. We also want the width and height, right? So I'm gonna just make a little placeholder here. We're gonna want the width and we're gonna want the height for each item. And what we can do to get that, if you saw in the hints, there is a string.split method which allows, it to, allows us to give it a particular character and then job, um, 
JavaScript will split our string into an array separated by that character. So what we can do is we can create a new array. Um, I can call it split here and um, have that be, if I take the item resolution, this is gonna be a string that has that X in the middle. So if I call split X, then I should get um, a little array with the um, with the two different parts of this as strings. So I can test that if I want to. Like up here, we had um, we were inspecting this device analytics dot zero. Or sorry, device analytics element at index zero. If I want to pull out the resolution of that, I can update this. And uh, again, if I want to run the code that I've changed in one of these cells, I can press Shift Enter or hit this little blue play icon. So let me press shift enter. And so, okay, this is the resolution. And then if I split that on the X character and shift enter, now I get an array with these two separate things. So this is what I'm gonna be getting in this split array here. So then the width is gonna be the first element in that array. So index zero and the height's gonna be index one. So I can pull that in here. So um, I can say width is split zero and height is split of one and I'll be pretty far along, but have I forgotten anything? Let's find out. So if I evaluate this with shift enter, now I can inspect my array here by clicking this little drop down. Okay, so I have the, the device, the resolution, aha, I've added width and height, but these are both still strings as I can see from the quotes. So I wanna convert those to numbers. And as we saw in the hints, I can do that with a little plus sign in front of the string. So if I add a plus here to both of these, then that should give me what I want. Let's try it. Shift enter and inspect my array. And now I have the width is a number and height is a number for each of these. Cool. So now our devices array has width and height values and their numbers. Any questions? And this was all in the solution as well. So you can copy, this is my solution. Yours might look different. You might have used things like JavaScript destructuring. You might have um, done it a different way. There are lots of different ways that one can solve any problem really in computer science, right? So, okay. Unless there's any questions, let's move right along because we got lots more to do. All right, so we wrangled some data. Excellent. Now we're gonna try to visualize it. And what we're going to use to visualize it is a really lightweight um, and hopefully quick to use library called plot, uh, observable plot. So um, this is a library, I don't know if folks have heard of the JavaScript library D3. Um, it, this is by the same creator of D3, Mike Bostock, who is also the CTO of Observable. And it's meant to be a very, very quick and easy to use library that helps you go from zero to visualization in as little time as possible. So you can read lots more about it um, after, after this uh, uh, session. But for now, we're just gonna look at some basic features of plot and we're gonna walk through it from scratch. So um, in any data visualization, what we're trying to do is go from features in the data. So properties of the data, which we can call features and take those and map them to properties of a chart or a visualization that we're trying to make. And one word that's used in the database community for those properties of the chart is a channel, sometimes called an encoding channel. So if we're thinking about a scatter plot in here, imagine we have a scatter plot of some statistics of Olympic athletes, like um, what sport they participate in, um, how, how tall they are, their height, how much they weigh. Um, if we have all this information in our data, then these are some of the features that we have. We have height, we have weight, maybe there's some other features like their sex or their age, the sport they play. So this is in our data. And what we're gonna do is map that to properties of this plot. For example, the X coordinate might be something we take the weight, the athlete's weight, and we put it on the X axis here. So we map the weight feature to the X channel, which is essentially a positional channel that says how far to the right on this chart it's going to be. So we're starting from zero over here. And similarly, we might have a Y channel that's the vertical position um, starting from the bottom. In this case, in other database libraries, it might start from the top and work out down. But in our case, it's going to start from the bottom and go up. That's, that is something that we can um, put uh, our height feature into. So we can map our height feature to our Y channel, 
our weight feature to our X channel. And then we also have um, this notion of color here. And if you notice, each of these dots is a little circle that is filled with a particular color. Um, so if you've worked with um, SVGs before, you might be familiar with this property called fill. Essentially, it stands for the, 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 the shading color of this, uh, of this mark here. In this case, it's a dot. And so what we could do is take the sport that they play, um, for example, basketball, gymnastics, or weightlifting and, weightlifting, and map that to the fill of each dot. So what we see now here is that we can see a little bit of information about different sports, right? Like we notice that the tallest athletes that we see here play basketball. The heaviest ones are weightlifters. That's really not surprising. The smallest um, kind of most petite uh, athletes that we have on this chart are gymnasts, it seems. And there's a little bit of overlap between them though as well. So this is, um, this is just an example of a very basic mapping from features in the data to channels in our visualization. And the way that we do that in plot is uh, like this. So plot as a library is gonna give us this object called capital P plot. And then from there, we're gonna call a particular type of mark that we want to put on our chart. Now, in this case, we're gonna be working with dots um, so that we make a, what's called a dot plot, which is what you see here. It's also called a scatter plot, if you've heard that term before. So we're gonna create that with plot dot dot. The next thing that we pass in is our data set as an array of objects. So in this case, we had like, let's say an array called athletes that has all these different features in the data. Um, in our case, we're gonna be working with this devices data. So that's what we'll be seeing in our example. And then we pass in an object which tells plot how to map features to channels. So the structure of this object is we have the name of a channel here and there are a few that we can use. Um, right now we're gonna focus on X, Y, and fill, fill being color again. And then we tell plot which feature we want to use for each channel using the name of the JavaScript property. So if in our data, weight is called lowercase weight and height is called lowercase height and so on and so forth, this is how we're telling plot map weight to the X channel, height to the Y channel and sport to the fill channel. And then we call dot plot on that whole thing to actually render the chart visually. So this is like, a super basic crash course in using observable plot um, or similar um, data viz libraries like uh, Vega Light is one that also talks about these uh, concepts of channels that can encode features in your data. Um, let me just pause right there in case there's any questions, because this is kind of the meat of the visualization here. Okay. Um, feel free to type in any questions in the in the Q and A and. Um, We'll try to keep an eye on them. Um, but there's one more thing we need to talk about when we talk about these channels um, and how we are mapping features from our data into these visual channels. And that's the concept of scales. So in a scale, what we're doing is we're converting the features in our data or the values that we see in our data, which exist in kind of a separate space. They exist in the data space. So for example, height, right? Like they exist in centimeters or, or inches and feet. And we're mapping those values into values in the visual space of the chart. So in this case, like pixels on a screen. And so what a scale does is it tells the visualization how to go from numbers in the data space to numbers in the visual space. And so what we're gonna be looking at in the exercises that we get into is how we can change the domain, meaning the input values, the data space values, and, the, it, and we could also think about constraining the range of the chart in order to um, affect exactly how, for example, how much space our data takes up visually in our chart. So these are a couple of key concepts for data viz. We have features in the data, um, we have channels in the visualization, and then we have scales which convert from a domain, the range of values in the data space to a range um, which is a range of values in the visual space. So sort of like functions in, uh, in, in, in math class, if you think about it that way, we're, we're mapping from a domain into a range of values. All righty, so unless there are any questions at the moment, which I don't see any, let us dig right back into our workbook. And this time we're gonna look at exercise two, which has three parts, A, B, and C, where we're gonna actually create a dot plot. So let's switch back there. 
Um, I'm going to scroll down to visualize the data. So now what we've got is this device's data. This is wrangled and ready to go. This device's data is what we're going to visualize next. Um, and so what we're going to try to do is understand which screen widths and heights and devices we see in the data with that scatter, scatter plot or dot plot. So in exercise 2A, we're just going to create a super basic visualization of width versus, versus height. So what we want to do is take um, the x-axis, the horizontal axis, and map that to width, and the y-axis and map it to height. And in order to do that, we're going to follow what we just saw in terms of how we can map um, channels to features or features to channels in our data in plot. So why don't we work, walk through this together? Um, I wish that, uh, or I, I guess folks can go off mute perhaps, but um, what we need to change is this code right here to edit it so that we actually get um, some, some data on our screen. Right now, we just basically have a big blank page here. So can anybody help me out? Why don't we do this together for the sake of time? So what I want to do is plot the screen width on the x-axis and height on the y-axis. And then we have a bonus here. We could also use, there's a channel called title that essentially lets us add tool tips. But let's get to that in a moment. So first of all, we need to change the values here for the, the properties of our data because to do change me is not a property of our data to map the channel X to the feature that we want. So I wish we could uh, do this a bit more interactively, but as folks have probably figured out, we want to put the width on the x-axis. So let's go back and check what that's called in our data. If I inspect that here, we called it width with a capital W. So what I'm going to do is go down here and change the text of what is after this x here to be width. And then if I press shift enter, that will, okay, well, it's got something here. We've got some numbers now happening. Not totally done yet though, because I'm also going to need to change what's on the Y channel. And you can probably figure this one out. We're going to change this to height. Okay, so it's not the most beautiful chart we've ever seen in our lives, but it is a chart. We've got now some data points. We've got some little circles being drawn on our chart. Okie doke. Please stop me if y'all have questions. Just moving through this together um, for the sake of time here. And then we also had this bonus. So there's another channel that we can use. So if we saw in our example before, we were talking about another channel called fill. So we had like a third channel here. Um, and there's, a, there's another channel that is called title that allows us to add a tool tip. So if I put a title channel here, I am a tool tip. Um, what I've done is just provided a, uh, oops, what did I miss? I missed a comma here. Okay. What I've done is just put a, a default value for the title. So now if I hover over one of these, um, oops, if I hover over one of these dots, hopefully I should see, of course it's not working or I don't know if you can see them. Um, I should see tooltips. Let's try this with the actual thing that we want to use, which is the resolution of each uh of each data point so we have that that resolution value that just shows us the width and height as a string so let's try that now if this has worked now okay i don't know if y'all can see this in my screen share but when i hover over one of these dots i see a little pop-up tooltip with the actual resolution so that was our bonus here okay so we've got a very basic plot Hopefully we're feeling good about that. But I don't know if I feel that great about this because it's it's pretty rough to read this. Like everything is kind of crammed down at the bottom here. Um, we have like a couple outliers up here. Somebody has a 20,000 pixel wide screen that's, or pixels high screen. That's pretty, that's a lot. Um, so I think what we want to do is probably um, kind of narrow down our focus to this main region here, which is where most of the data seems to be. So if we if we kind of zoom in here, we should be able to get a bit, bit better picture of what's happening. So that's what we're going to do in exercise 2B 
is we're going to take our code from up here. I'm just going to copy paste it. Um, we can get rid of this. Copy this. Control C, and then I'm going to paste it here. Control V. Okay. And so now I'm starting from the point of uh, this this plot that we don't really like. And what I want to do is make the plot look a little less funky than it does right now. So what we're going to do is instead of um, instead of messing with the way that we're mapping uh, features in the data to channels, what we're going to do is think about the scales that we were talking about before of how the domain of the data that we're mapping that, so we, that we're charting maps to the visual space that we're working in. So in this case, what we've got is we've got by default, the data goes from something like zero pixels to 20,000 pixels high and uh, from zero to 8,000 pixels wide. And so what plot has done is it has mapped that whole domain of zero to 20,000 or zero to 8,000 to the available visual space. Um, so however many pixels tall this is, however many pixels wide it is, depending on my screen. So what we want to do is um, is to make sure that the domain, the input data that we're passing into the visualization stops at a certain width. So we're going to try to get widths up to 500 pixels and heights up to 2600 pixels represented here and kind of chop off the rest of the data. Um, so just for the sake of speed here, we can um, where we can we can read these sort of hints down here. So this object um, that I pass into this plot method sets some options for how the plot is displayed. So what we already had out of the box was we're setting a particular width on it. Observable gives us a width variable that, that tells us how wide this area of the screen is. So we're using that. And then the height we're also setting as like half of the width. And what we can do is add in some more properties here to control how the X and Y scales are set up. So this, um, this function that maps from features uh, from values, excuse me, in the data space to values in the visual space. Um, and so there is uh, there, I, what I can do is pass in an object to the X and to the Y properties here in this second object that I'm passing into the plot, which essentially sets, sets up the, the options for each scale here. So the X scale is gonna control how this X axis is drawn. And so if I, um, if I continue reading my little guides here, there is a domain property that I can use to control the domain of each one. And if I open up my hints, I get a hint here that the domain takes in an array that takes a minimum number and a maximum number, and that is going to constrain the domain for that scale. So if I take my X uh, scale here, this is my horizontal one, and I want to cut it off at like 5,000 because these are just kind of outliers. Some people with some really big screens here. There's not too many of them. I'm just going to not worry about them right now. What I can do is set the minimum for the domain to be zero and the max to be 5,000. And when I update that, we should see the chart update. So now it's zoomed in a little bit horizontally. So what we're going to do next is we're going to um, do a similar thing for the Y scale. In this case, we want it to stop around, uh, what did we say before? Heights up to 2600 pixels. So you can probably see where I'm going with this. We're going to change the minimum will still be zero, but then we're going to change the maximum for the Y domain to be 2600. And if I press shift enter to run that code, then we get a more readable chart. What do you all think? Hopefully that's working fine. And we might see, okay, there's actually, there's not a lot of users below, I don't know, 200 pixels in either case. So if I wanted to, to chop it off even more at the bottom, I could make the minimum values something like 200 and cut that part off as well. So at this point, it's kind of up to you. You can mess with this a little bit to get it how you'd like. Maybe you wanna make it a little higher than 2600 to include that one point there that seems to be at 2700. It's up to you, but at this point, hopefully we see how we can control the domain of the values in the data that we want to see visualized on the chart. And what plot is doing is it's taking that 
more constrained domain and now mapping it to the same range, so that the same width of pixels, so that we get a bigger kind of picture of that domain, if that makes sense. Let me check if there's any questions before we move on to part C. Don't have a ton of time left together, so let's keep rolling. Okay. So now we've got a plot that is a little bit more usable. I'm going to copy this again, um, control C. Now what we want to do is add some color, right? So um, before we saw that we had that fill channel in our, in our sports visualization that we saw here. Um, we were using that fill channel to visualize each different sport. And what we're going to do here is a similar thing, but instead of the sport, it's going to be the device type. So um, I'll give everybody a couple of minutes to do this on your own. Um, what change can you make to, to, um, to get the device to be visualized in the fill channel? And then if, uh, if you're done with that, we can just take a few minutes for everybody to do this themselves. If, you've, if you figure out the fill channel, also try to take a look at this fill opacity channel. What that'll do is make dots transparent so that we can see them. And then there's a super bonus. You can also try to change the radius R of each dot um, to convey the uh, number of sections. So what we're doing in this exercise is, whoops, we are essentially playing around with which features do we have and which channels can we use to express those features. So let's take a couple of minutes here and let everybody play with their turns. Try to get some more color information going on in here. Don't forget there's some hints as well. Just take one more minute and see how far we can get. Okay, I can't really see how everybody's doing. <laughs> um, so please uh, ask questions if you have any. But since we are, the time is just marching along here, let's, um, let's go ahead and review what this answer might look like. So if you looked at some of the hints here, you essentially got each of the building blocks that we need for this. Let's go through them one by one. Okay, so we had our title property here. I'm gonna add a comma to add more channels. We said there's a fill channel that controls the, the coloring, the, the shading in of each of these dots. And so I want that to correspond to the device feature in the data, which has a capital D. So let me try that first, shift enter. So now we get, okay, this is already a little bit better. I can see um, the, I think the desktop dots are in blue and the uh, mobile dots are in yellowish orange. Um, and then we have a few tablet dots in red here. 
But since these are all kind of on top of each other, it's a little hard to see where the different dots are. So that's where opacity comes in. So there's another channel called fill opacity um, that is going to control the opacity of each of these dots. And what I can do is instead of like these, these properties, they're all um, essentially mapping to a property of the data. So this is gonna be a different value for each data point, depending on what the value of each feature was for that data point. For the fill opacity, what I can do is set a constant value for every point. So in this case, let me just give everything an opacity of 0 0.5. So opacity going from zero to invisible to one, which is uh, totally opaque, which is what we have now. Let me just put it right in the middle with a 0 0.5 opacity. So what I see now is that since the dots are a little bit shaded, I can see where there are multiple. So I can see like a lot of people are at this, uh, what is this, 1920 width here. And a lot of people are in this aspect ratio of uh, this, uh, I think it's a 16 to nine aspect ratio there and so on and so forth. And I can see some of, I can see a little bit more information here. Um, and then there was one other challenge or, or bonus, uh, which was to use the radius or the size of the dots to convey the number of sessions for each resolution that I saw. And so what we can do there is actually pass in a function. So um, in plot, each of these channels can also take in a function if we'd like. So I'm gonna make a little JavaScript arrow function that takes in each data point, each item in the data and returns, um, if I want to do the sessions, I can do item.sessions. And this is essentially a longhand way of saying, our sessions, right? But if I do that, let's just, let's see what that looks like for a moment, just for fun. If I make it the number of sessions, oh goodness, something has gone terribly wrong here. Why is that? Well, because we've got a huge drastic um, distribution in the data of um, some, some resolutions have like a ton of sessions and some only have a few. And so if I use absolute numbers from the data, I get these like extremely huge dots that take up my entire chart and essentially make it useless. Although it does look like kind of cool art, maybe if the computer is feeling like being artistic. So instead, what I wanna do is um, take the log of that number. So this is a type of thing in data wrangling that you might sometimes have to do when you're visualizing. So what I can do is pass in, um, pass this sessions number into math.log, which in JavaScript is how we'll take the, the, um, the log of a number, and then hopefully get a little bit more reasonable of a view. So now I have some dots are a little bigger than others, as I can see here. So I can see some of these dots are like, there's more people at this 3440 uh, times 1440 than there are at uh, 3491 times 1455. So uh, or more sessions, I should say, not necessarily more people. So this is just an example of how you can pass in functions, you can pass in constant values, or you can pass in properties from the data to, um, to get the features that you want into the channels that you need. So now we've got a pretty nice scatter plot. What do y'all think? It's not bad, huh? It's looking a lot better. It's come a long way from up here, huh? No, much, much, much more useful, I think. Um, but in the next uh, exercise, which we're gonna power through in the last 10 minutes that we have together, we're gonna see how we can make this even more useful. So, and that is by adding some interactivity. So let's, um, let's go back to our slides here. And of course, if you have questions, keep them coming. Hopefully this, uh, this walkthrough was okay, was clear. Um, if not, remember there's some hints and then also the solutions that I've been sharing um, in those buttons that you can reveal. Okay, so let's return to our slides here. Um, the next thing that we want to do, um, and this is sort of an optional nice to have, but it can be a really nice thing to do is to add interactivity to your visualizations. And that's because data can be a lot easier to understand when you can play with it, when you can actually get hands on with it and you can explore it interactively. So for example, here, um, this, is a, this is a fork of, a, of some charts from an observable um, notebook that essentially is intended to help startups figure out their finances. And so what I've got here is a little simulation of, okay, how much cash does my startup have in the bank? Um, on what date uh, did I get that check? And what is my runway going to look like? So when am I gonna run out of money? If we're in uh, May right now, what is this gonna look like going forward? And so I can play with these sliders here I can say, okay, if I get a lot more money, then we're going to have a lot more runway and I'm not going to run out of money by December. But, oh no, if that drops to zero, I am already out of money here. 
Um, or if it's a little bit less, I might run out in October, for example. And similarly, if I get this, uh, if it's uh, if it, I change the dates here, that might change how this um, projection runs out. So if I get an influx in June, that might that might help me. But oh no, I've already run out of money. But if I have a little bit more, it could help. So in any case, the idea is that when when I can get my hands on the data, I'm able to kind of play with it and and really create a, a stronger mental model of what that data means and how it relates to my particular needs, whether I want to know about a particular um, a particular type of, of, of uh, financial projection or I'm looking at a coronavirus chart and I want to know about a particular geographic range or a particular age range or what have you. So um, the nice thing about doing data visualization in JavaScript is that it's really easy to put in these kind of widgets because we're doing all of this live in a web page. So we have HTML at our fingertips. So making these sliders and making these this interactive um, data visualization is super easy when we're doing it in JavaScript. So that's what we're going to do in our last exercise. We're just going to take like five minutes here to um, put some interactive controls into our visualization. So those checkboxes that we saw at the beginning here, if I go all the way back to this example that we saw at the beginning, um, we are going to add some checkboxes that allow us to select or deselect these different types of devices. Cool. Okay, so let's hop back to our step three in whoops in the workbook. I'm gonna scroll down here back to the workbook, scroll down to exercise three. Um, and what we're going to do is add interactivity that allows us to select by device. So um, what we have in observable is a really handy dandy little tool called inputs.checkbox. And what that does is it creates a little HTML widget. If I put in some options here, option one, oops, option two, and I evaluate this, I'll get little checkboxes with the options that I've laid out in an array here. And what Observable does is if I use this, um, this keyword here, view of, with a name of this array, selected devices, what that does is it allows us to capture the value selected in an array called selected devices. So right now, that array is empty because nothing is selected. But if I were to check one of these, we see that automatically updates to have option one or both of them or just option two. So this is essentially um, observable is a reactive environment that lets you easily work with interactivity like this. So what we're going to do is um, take our code from this nice, our, our nicest scatter plot yet, and paste it down here again. And what I want to do is, first of all, get a checkbox up here that allows me to select the devices, the device types that I have in my data. So this device category. Um, now, in a more complicated data set, I might want to like dynamically pull those values from the data. But in this case, just for the sake of time, I know that there's only three options here, and they are desktop, mobile, and tablet. So I'm going to type those in. So we'll do this. We'll do this exercise together, just for the sake of time, since we're almost out of it. So if I type in desktop, mobile, and tablet, now I get some uh, some options here. And if I check them, then I can see my selected devices array updates to have whatever. Uh, the user has selected here. In this case, the user is me. And I can also, if I want, I can provide a default value um, to this checkbox input by putting it, passing in a little object that says value. And maybe I want just by default, let's have desktop be checked. So what this means is uh, when I reevaluate this cell, shift enter, essentially, oops, nope, sorry. The value, if I noticed before, um, when I check desktop, it's not actually the string desktop, it's an array that contains the string desktop. So I forgot that just now. So let me make that an array. And now when I reevaluate this um, with shift enter, desktop will already be checked. So if I uncheck it and I check mobile, as soon as I shift enter, desktop gets checked again as the default, just to have something that works there. Okay, so we've got a little checkbox now that gives us the selected values, but what we want to do is connect that to our chart. 
So how can we do that? And I'm skipping ahead. This is all in the um, in the hints. If you want to do this on your own at your own pace later, but just because we're running out of time, let's um, let's power through. So we've got the checkbox now. What we want to do is filter the data to only display data for the devices selected. So here we have our data in the form of devices, but we want to add a filter to that. And so what I'm going to do is we've already got that one. I'm going to I'm going to call dot filter on my devices array. And I'm going to pass in an array, uh, sorry, a function that tells it what I want to test each item in the array against. We also have a handy method in JavaScript called dot includes that you can call on an array to see if an array includes a certain value. So I'm going to combine these together on my devices array here to find out whether um, the selected values, the selected devices here, whether the, the value of each data point is in that selected devices. So if it has desktop and mobile, I only want to select values that are desktop or mobile. So I can do this by doing devices.filter. And then for each item in my data, I want to return a Boolean of whether or not the selected devices, which right now is desktop and mobile, whether or not that includes the items device. So let's see, do I have the right number of parentheses here? I think so, yes. So what I've got now is I'm filtering my entire devices array and filtering it to tell me for each item, only include it in the final data if the device for that data point is included in my selected devices array. So once I do that, if I press shift enter, now, oh, I just saw a bunch of red dots disappear because tablet was not selected. So let me, um, so another nice thing about observable is you can move cells around. I'm just gonna click these three dots right here next to the, next to the, um, the cell here. These are little cells, these little chunks of code. I'm gonna pull it down just so it's a little closer. I'm also going to, so there's a concept of pinning or unpinning cells, unpinning this cell by clicking this little thumbtack. It's just going to let me um, let me not worry about that code anymore so I can see what's happening here. So now if I've done this correctly, every time selected devices updates, Observable is going to rerun this code. So it's going to filter out based on the new array. So if I uncheck mobile, I get only my desktop devices. If I check tablet, but not desktop, I get only the tablet devices. So I see there's a lot fewer. And if I only select mobile, and tablet, then I see all these little tiny little mobile screens and the slightly bigger um, tablet ones, etc. Or I can select all three and now essentially I have the same chart that I did before. So this is just an example of the type of interactivity that we can create. Um, Checkboxes are just one thing. There is a whole bunch of other inputs that you can um, use. So there's some links in here if you want to um, uh, play around on your own. You can check out these um, in Observable. You have these this notion of these input, uh, like or up here. If I open this, we use this inputs dot checkbox. There are a bunch of other ones. Um, earlier we saw like a slider, for example. There are buttons. There are toggles, um, radio buttons, selects, text inputs, all kinds of stuff you can play with. So. I'd encourage you to, to have fun with that. And um, if you're doing more data viz on your own in the future, try out some of the other interactive widgets that you can create. And these are all essentially HTML form elements. So, okay, we finished our project. We have our interactive chart now. Pretty exciting. I hope everybody feels good about that. We made, we made a visualization in hopefully not too much time here. Um, I don't see any questions popping up, but uh, please let me know if y'all do have questions. I think we are just about out of time or maybe we are a minute over. So let me really quickly wrap up here, but um, just to, to go over again, recap our takeaways. Uh, we essentially saw hopefully how data visualization can help us understand the jobs that we have as developers. So this visualization that we made um, tells us a little bit about how our users are using our site uh, it can tell us like, okay, we need to pay attention to portrait mode for mobile users, or we need to pay attention to the fact that some of our desktop users have really, really big screens. So we want to make sure that our website looks good uh, for them. 
and so on and so forth. So it can help us figure out our user interfaces and our designs. Um, and if we're looking at different data, we could be asking questions about our development workflows or how we can improve our site performance. So there's a lot of questions that DataViz can help us as web developers or whatever kind of software developers answer and make decisions about. Um, we also saw how to how to wrangle and visualize our data with JavaScript. So we used um, just some built in JavaScript features like array filters and maps. Um, we used observable plot as a lightweight visualization library. And we also used some of those HTML inputs, those inputs that checkbox um, to add some interactivity. And if you want to go on from here, working in JavaScript for data visualization, there are a lot of other tools that can allow you to create even more complex and even more customized visualizations. Plot is a really nice one because it's quick and easy, but it also doesn't allow you to customize everything. So you might want to check out D3.js. Um, you might want to check out another library called Vega Lite. There are also, like I said, some more tools for if you have more complicated data wrangling that you need to do, if you need to do a lot of processing on your data. There are some libraries like Arcaro and TidyJS, and there's a bunch more tools. So in the slides, there's a lot of resources linked. Um, you can read more, and there are some tutorials and um, introductory uh, in in introductions to these different libraries you can play with on your own. And um, we just need to remember when we're when we're creating visualizations in the process of doing data viz, we need to think about how to reshape our data so that it can actually answer the questions that we want to answer. Like in our case, we needed to go from having a string of the resolution to having two separate numbers. So we needed to reshape that data that way. Um, and depending on your data set and your problem you're trying to solve or the question you're trying to answer, that reshaping is going to look different. Then we need to think about which features in the data we want to visualize through which channels or which properties of the visualization. So which properties in the data do we want to map to things like the X position, the Y position, the fill color, et cetera. We also need to think about how we want to scale the data that we have to the display values. Like, for example, do we want to constrain the domain of the values that we're looking at, like we saw earlier, so that we can have a more informative graph? And we also want to think about how can we use interactivity to help people explore it. Maybe that people is me. And I want to be able to really quickly explore this data and, and look at what I'm interested in. If I'm focusing on my mobile development this week, I want to just look at that data, et cetera. So really thinking about how can I make this interactive so that whoever is looking at it, whether it's me or one of my teammates, can get to what they need as quickly as possible and be able to play with the data hands-on to understand, um, to create a better mental, mo mental model of what is in that data. So um, there are some further readings in the in the slides here, um, and that link is in the Q and A again. So I'll let y'all um, take a look at that on your own pace. There's a bunch of like kind of intro to data visualization posts. There are some more tutorials and um, documentation. If you uh, like using this kind of interactive, reactive environment and observable, you can um, try that out more. There are some guides to to how to use that and some of the different things you can do in observable. Um, and then there's also a bunch of links to just generally, if you're curious to learn more about data visualization and how professionals do it, um, there's a bunch of great links in here. So that is about it. Um, sorry to be a couple minutes past you because of those technical issues at the beginning, but huge thank you to Alper and to um, Code Day Labs for having me. Huge thank you to all of you for coming out and, um, and playing with this data. And big thanks to all my teammates at Observable who helped um, pull together these materials. Um, and I'm Anjana Vakil, again, developer advocate at Observable in San Francisco. You can find me at Anjana Vakil on Twitter. Um, you can also find more of the notebooks and, and talks and things that I give on Observable in that at Anjana um, moniker. And yeah, um, if folks have more questions, I'm happy to hang out and answer any in the Q&A. And otherwise, just thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anjana, for all the time you spent with us today and giving us an absolutely awesome and very thorough introduction to DataViz. It was very helpful, and hopefully it was helpful to the audience, too, because I know it helped me. Um, Hope so. Thank you yeah, thanks again. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. It was an honor to have you, and thank you on behalf of everyone at Code Day Labs. My pleasure, and um, yeah, congratulations on completing. I understand a very, uh, a very eventful and uh, action-packed uh, session um, or, or series, I suppose. And yeah, yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor to be the last talk of the series. So, 
Um, yeah, and please, please keep the questions coming if folks have any, or if you want to reach out um, later. I'm also Anjana at observablehq.com um, if you want to email. And uh, yeah, I hope this was, I hope this was just a, just a real nice little um, sampler platter, a little taste, taste test, as it were, of um, some of the things we can do with DataBiz. So yeah, it was lots a, more where that came from. <laughs> it was an awesome introduction. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much Thank for you. having me. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Uh, unless anyone else has a question, which I don't see any right now. Um, yeah, thank you for being our last speaker again. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.